Hello, everyone. Welcome back to this week's Algebraic Grad Series seminar. This week, we have Bill Martin to tell us about the polynomial ideals, association schemes, and the Q polynomial properties. Thanks very much, Tina. And uh, thanks very much. It's, it's an honor to uh, speak in such a nice seminar. And, uh, and I hope that uh, I can say something that's interesting. Uh, I didn't mention when I, when I sent the abstract that uh, bits and pieces of this are based on uh, joint papers with uh, Andres Brower, Corey Steele, Doug Stinson, and Ethan Washuk. The paper with Andres just showed up on the Elsevier website, uh, I think yesterday or the day before. So um, uh, let's start off with, oh, now I have to get my uh, cursor to talk to the, there we go, okay. So let's start off with the three cube. And I have a puzzle for you. Think of a quadratic polynomial that is zero, quadratic polynomial in three variables that's zero on all of these eight points. So here are the eight points of the three cube. And I want to think of a quadratic polynomial that's zero on every one of those points. And you each will think of a quadratic polynomial. Um, and uh, I bet you don't get the one that I get. So, um, so we look at these points and I come up with this polynomial. Uh, Z2 squared minus five Z1 squared well, six Z three squared minus two. This polynomial vanishes. But you probably came up with uh, Z one squared minus one, or Z two squared minus one, or Z three squared minus one, because the first coordinate, uh, all the entries are plus or minus one. So um, it turns out that anything that you came up with that was correct um, was a linear combination of those three quadratics. So anything that vanishes that has degree two, it's a linear combination of Z1 squared minus one, Z2 squared minus one, and Z3 squared minus one. This is a spherical three design. Uh, that means that any polynomial in three variables of degree at most three, uh, in three in three variables, total degree at most three, uh, the integral over the sphere is exactly equal to, well, the, the average over the sphere is exactly equal to the average over these eight points. If I scale them to unit vectors, I'm, I'm gonna play, um, uh, play around with, with with the lengths of vectors just for convenience. I'm not too worried. I'm going to call this a spherical design, even a spherical code, even though it's uh, the vectors don't have length one. So that z1 squared minus one is an interesting thing because it factors. It's a zonal polynomial. So it's a zonal polynomial uh, with this normal vector, this red normal vector, and every vector in the in the cube has inner product either plus one or minus one with that vector, one, one, one. And, uh, uh, sorry, one, zero, zero. Um, and so, uh, so this gives rise to an equitable partition. It turns out that the vertices closest to the red vector are completely regular code. The vertices closest to the red, to the red vector induce a Q polynomial subscheme. We have one, uh, we have width plus dual width equal to the number of classes of the association scheme. And so we have what Tanaka calls a descendant. So we have Tanaka's descendants. And this is, this seems anomalous and, and very special, but it's not that special. Actually, this kind of thing happens with these quadratic polynomials in, in many more cases. Let's go to another example. Uh, oh, oh, no, sorry, let me go back to, uh, I'm sticking with the cube. I'm looking at the Hamming lattice. So now I like to think of the three cube, instead of thinking of the characters as diagonalizing the Bose-Mesner algebra, I'd like to think of a bunch of zero one vectors. Um, and and uh, the zero one vectors with one one and seven zeros are, are these things at the top. I don't know, can you see my cursor, Tina? My cursor visible. These things at the top are the, are the standard basis vectors. The all ones vectors here, and this, and this indicates this crazy notation means dot dot dot. Where I don't care what value there is in the first coordinate, I don't care what value in the second coordinate, I don't care about the value in the third coordinate either. And that's a, the all ones vector. Now the thing that we just looked at, zero dot dot, is this completely regular code. And each one of these points in this lattice, if I look at the vertices at the top that are above it, that is all different ways to complete this to a vertex of, of the graph. Um, all of these are completely regular codes. So in, if I instead took, um, yeah, here we go. So that, um, where is it? There we go. If I instead took dot one one, I'd have a completely regular code of size two and the vertices are zero one one, and one, 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 those are the two vertices above this red point in, in the, in the uh, Hamming lattice. And that gives me a completely regular, uh, a completely regular code. And it also gives me a 
polynomial in the ideal um, that's cubic, it's not quadratic. And that cubic polynomial is also a zonal polynomial. And that just separates the, it sorts out the vertices of the cube according to their inner product with this red vector. So there's this edge that's closest and then there are four vertices uh, with an inner product zero with that vector and then there are two vertices further away. So we're interested in this ideal, the ideal of X, we have a subset of the unit sphere, almost always in the real numbers, I'm gonna work over the reals, the spherical code, and I define the ideal of X to be the set of all polynomials and M variables, where M is the dimension, that vanish at all the points of X. So this ideal always contains, if I have a spherical code, this ideal always contains the principal ideal generated by the equation of the sphere. So Z1 squared plus Z2 squared plus dot, 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 minus one, that's uh, trivial, trivially, um, in the ideal, and I call the principal ideal generated by that single polynomial, the trivial ideal. So I want to think about only about non-trivial polynomials. So a polynomial that vanishes on the code, but doesn't vanish on the entire sphere, I'm going to say is non-trivial. So for the cube up uh, above, the equation of the sphere, I scaled it because it, 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 the vectors had length root three for convenience. The trivial ideal is generated by this single polynomial and the ideal of the entire eight points is generated by this. And I'm not going to get into the null Stellensatz. I have to check that this is a radical ideal and so on. I'm not going to deal with that. I uh, just trust that the tedious um, technicalities have been taken care of. Uh, so the parameters I'm interested in, um, if I have a spherical code, I'm interested in gamma one, the smallest degree of a non-trivial polynomial in the ideal, and gamma two, the smallest k such that I can generate the idea with polynomials of total degree at most k. Now, I don't care how many polynomials are in my generating set G. I, I, in fact, it might be useful to just close this under the action of the automorphism group. I'm not, interest, I'm not interested in minimizing the number of polynomials in G. I just want them all to have low degree. So I'm trying to minimize the maximum degree of a polynomial in G over all generating sets for the ideal. Any questions at this point? Yeah, what is this T that you're using there? I missed it in gamma one definition. Ah, yeah, T is the trivial ideal generated by the equation of the sphere. It's this said it's just this principal ideal of things that vanish on every spherical code. It doesn't give me any, any information about this particular spherical code. So T is the trivial ideal. Is that clear? Okay, I'm gonna assume that was a yes. There it is. Okay, so for the cube, for the three cube, we had that the smallest degree of a non-trivial polynomial because the, the, the vertices, um, the vertices, the ve eight vectors span R3, so they don't live in a hyperplane. So the smallest degree of a non-trivial polynomial is two, and I can generate the entire, entire ideal using polynomials of degree two. Now, I, you notice that I called that a spherical code, but the vectors really had um, length root three. I'm also not going to worry about affine transformations. The, the origin might get moved and so on. I just have to keep track of what, uh, what polynomials are trivial. As long as I keep track of what the trivial ideal is, I'm going to uh, play fast and loose with change of coordinates and, um, and, and not worry about uh, making it exactly a spherical code. The second one that I wanna talk about is the icosahedron, another platonic solid. Four of the five platonic solids are Q-polynomial association schemes. The dodecahedron doesn't cooperate. So if you take the golden ratio and, uh, and you take all vectors of the form zero plus or minus one, zero plus or minus golden ratio and rotate cyclically, uh, you get the 12 vertices of the icosahedron. And you can think of those um, these four right here form a rectangle, a golden rectangle. These four form a golden rectangle in the x1, x2 plane. These four form a golden rectangle in the x1, x3 plane. And they'll take those three golden rectangles, and then you join up nearest neighbors, and you throw away the golden rectangles, and you have the icosahedron. Now, there's an obvious polynomial in the ideal of a spherical code. I can take this north pole right here and I can just look at the different inner products. The inner products are one, one over root five, negative one over root five, negative one. And I can take that zonal polynomial 
of degree four that will slice off these two pentagons. And then it will have a, a, a plane that just hits the North Pole and a plane that just hits the South Pole. Well, that polynomial is degree four. We can do a little bit better by just replacing those two planes by a plane that passes through the North and South Pole. So I call this a sliced zonal polynomial. So this is uh, Corey Steele was a summer student and undergrad on my NSA grant. And, um, and we realized that, uh, that we could quickly cut down the degree of these polynomials when we had an antipodal uh, polytope. So we have this icosahedron, and it turns out that these sliced zonal polynomials, I can take two uh, choices for the blue plane that, um, to, to get uh, intersection equal to a line. And I take these 12 polynomials of this sort, and I find out that the smallest degree of a non-trivial polynomial in this ideal is exactly three, and the ideal is generated by these 12 polynomials of degree three. There's another example. So here's the general setup. Again, X is uh, usually a spherical code. And the ideal is the set of all polynomials and M variables that vanish at each point of X. The trivial ideal is the ideal generated by the equation of the sphere. Sometimes I abbreviate this to norm squared minus one on a later slide. Gamma one is the smallest degree of a non-trivial polynomial in the ideal. And gamma two is the smallest k, such that the ideal can be generated by some set of polynomials of degree at most k. Spherical t design is this unit uh, set of unit vectors, the property that for any polynomial in m variables of degree at most t, the average over the sphere is exactly equal to the average over this set. Okay, so the Riemann sum is exact for polynomials of degree up to t. And we're very interested in spherical t-designs, and we'd like to find more very, very small spherical t-designs with very large t, but they're very hard to find. So for example, the icosahedron is a spherical five design, 12 points, and I'm going to use this d for the number of non-zero angles between vectors. So d plus one here is four distinct angles, including zero. So here are some spherical t-designs that are important. The shortest vectors of these famous lattices so the 24 cell, we have 24 vectors in R4, and that's a spherical five design. E6 and E7 are derived designs of E8. So that is, you can take E8, the shortest vectors of the E8 root lattice, there are 240 of them in dimension eight, and that's a tight spherical seven design. And you can slice with a hyperplane, you can get um, the shortest vectors of E7 translated away from the origin. And that's 126 vectors forming a spherical five design. And you can slice with a, with a co-dimension two subspace and get E6, 72 vectors in R6 forming a spherical five design. Of course, the, the beautiful, beautiful object is the leech lattice, which is 196,560 vectors in R24. And that's a tight spherical 11 design. We'd love to find uh, more spherical 11 designs that are small. We can't find any more tight ones. This is the only one, except in, in uh, I think, in, in maybe a polygon. So uh, Aichi Banai noticed that um, if you have any polynomial in the ideal, um, and its degree is less than, uh, less than or equal to t over 2 for a spherical t design, then the polynomial must be trivial. Any polynomial whose degree is too small, is less than or equal to t over two, must be in the trivial ideal. So the proof is very easy. The polynomial, you square it, it's a non-negative polynomial. It's zero at every point of x. So therefore, its, zero, it's, it's uh, average over x is zero, but it's non-negative. And so its average over the sphere is zero. And the only way for a polynomial to be non-negative on the sphere and have average zero is that it's zero on the entire sphere. That is, it's divisible by the, the equation is, uh, the polynomial is divisible by the equation of the sphere. So here's bounds on these gamma one and gamma two that I'm going to be talking about today. If I have a spherical T design emitting D plus one distinct angles, then, um, oh, is this is supposed to be less than or equal to, there's a typo here. T over two is, is, is less than or equal to gamma one, is less than or equal to gamma two, less than or equal to D plus one. This is a typo right here, okay? Um, so the, 
So the um, the project with Corey Steele, we decided to take these beautiful, beautiful lattices as sort of um, nice examples to study first. And we did an in-depth study, worked out generating sets for the ideals for each of these things. And it turns out for each one of them, gamma one is equal to gamma two. This is not gonna happen in general, but gamma one is equal to gamma two. So uh, a regular n-gon is, um, is a spherical t design for t equal n minus one. And so it turns out that n-gons are terrible. The, the, the degree of the polynomials goes off to infinity as the poly polygon gets uh, more and more sides to it. But for the 24 cell, it's a five design. So the best you can do, smallest degree of non-trivial polynomial is bigger than five halves. So it's three, and it turns out you can generate the idea by polynomials of degree three. This is a set of mutually unbiased bases, but it's a maximal set of mutually unbiased bases. And um, interesting things happen when you have non-maximal sets of mutually unbiased bases, real mutually unbiased bases. E6 uh, is five design also. So the smallest degree of a polynomial and not, that's non-trivial is bigger than uh, is bigger than or equal to five halves. So it's three, and it turns out you can generate the ideal by polynomials of degree three. Same with E7 and um, E8, you can generate the ideal by polynomials of degree four, and four is the best you can do by that Van Eye lemma. And for, for the leech lattice, I was really worried about this. I thought that I would need polynomials of very high degree. Certainly 11 halves is a lower bound. So six is the best we can do. And we found a generating set of polynomials of degree exactly six. Oh, let's say they all had degree at most six. I think I used the equation of the sphere in there. So we, um, in, in that paper with Corey in, in the Journal of Algebraic Combinatorics, we studied what happens when you move from a design to a uh, derived design. So you can also get generating sets for the derived designs of the leech lattice, which give us some, some Q polynomial association schemes. So what's an association scheme? So let me start by just motivating this by saying, if I have a finite group acting on a finite set X, then it acts on pairs also. And that partitions X cross X into binary relations. If the group happens to act transitively, then one of the relations is the identity relation, the diagonal relation. And, uh, and I can take that to be R0. If in, in the group G, we also have an element that swaps any two elements. For any A and B, there's an element of G that swaps the two. Then A, B, and B, A are going to fall, form, fall into the same orbit under that group. And so all these are symmetric relations that will have simple graphs. So I think that this is one way to motivate the definition of an association scheme, to think of a partition of X cross X and just simple graphs that are highly regular. And let's just throw away the group assumption and write down the combinatorial residue of that assumption. So we have a finite set X of size V and we partition X cross X into D plus one binary relations. We call it a symmetric association scheme. If one of the relations, which we always take to be R zero for convenience is the identity relation. Each of the relations is symmetric. And there are these constants P I J K these integers P I J K such that when a and C, so we, we want to think of the, the, the idea of a group acting, if A and C are K-related and A prime and C prime are K-related, then there should be a group element that maps these pair pairwise to the other pair. And therefore the ith neighborhood of uh, the I neighbors of A intersect the J neighbors of C should have the same size as the I neighbors of A prime intersect the J neighbors of C prime. So we throw away the group assumption and we just assume that these numbers are constant that if A and B, I changed to A and C, if A and B are K-related, then the number of C, such that A and C are, are I-related and C is J-related to B is a constant PIJK. And one nice thing about this is that it just immediately makes even more sense when you think of the adjacency matrices. So now you have that association scheme and for each relation RI, you associate a zero one matrix, rows and columns indexed by the vertices, and you put a one if B and C are I related, and you put a zero otherwise. And well, R zero was the identity relation, so A zero is the identity matrix. The relations partitioned X cross X, so the adjacency matrices summed to the all ones matrix. The relations were symmetric, so the matrices are symmetric. And these PIJKs tell us exactly that the product of two of these adjacency matrices is a linear combination of these adjacency matrices. So this is a Bose-Messner algebra. This is uh, this vector space is closed under matrix multiplication. 
Ah, but the AIs also are adjacency matrices of edge disjoint graphs. So it's closed under entry-wise multiplication as well. And we'll use that. So we have this, this vector space A is uh, commutative algebra of symmetric matrices, and it's also closed under entry-wise multiplication. So we treat the set of complex valued functions on the vertices as the standard module. This algebra acts on this module under the ordinary matrix vector product, and the module breaks up into D plus one maximal common eigenspaces for the graphs. And we want to consider matrices which project orthogonally onto each of these VJs, we call these the primitive idempotents. So EJ is the matrix that projects V orthogonally onto VJ, and we get a second basis for the Bosemester algebra that satisfy these conditions. We can choose one of them. One of them is a rank one matrix that projects onto the uh, span of the all ones vector. We call that E0. Uh, the projection sum up to the projection on the entire space. So that's the identity. Each of these projections is a symmetric matrix. And because the algebra is closed under entrywise multiplication, the entrywise product of the EJs is some linear combination of the EJs. These coefficients, Q, I, J, K, are really interesting to me. I still don't understand them, but they're called the Krein parameters. We can prove they're non-negative, but um, I, I'd really like to understand these Q, I, J, Ks better. So those coefficients are called the Krein parameters. Um, just, uh, this is really an aside, so I'm going to do this quickly. We use MJ to note, to note the dimension of the jth eigenspace, or the rank of EJ, and VI to be the valency of the ith graph. And, uh, and the change of basis matrices from, A's, from E's to A's and A's to E's uh, satisfy this orthogonality relation that look like the, the uh, orthogonality relations in character theory. But I think I just brought that in to show you how similar, because everything's commutative, the entrywise product and the matrix product, they just look so similar. AI matrix product AJ is the linear combination of AKs. EI entrywise EJ is a linear combination of EKs. AI entrywise AJ, it's zero if I is not equal to J. EI times EJ is zero if I is not equal to J. And likewise, uh, you have these nice parallel between the two things where you swap the two multiplications and you swap this matrix, the identity matrix and the all ones matrix, which is the identity for entry-wise multiplication. Some of these things come from posets. There's a thing called a regular semi-lattice introduced by Del Sartre. It's really beautiful, but I, I just need some basic properties of that. So I'm going to call this a Q poset. So suppose we specify uh, an ordering of these primitive idempotents, E0 up to ED, and, uh, and let VJ be the column space of EJ. We want to build a poset so that the vertices of our association scheme are at the top. And at each level, this ranked poset, if we take the, the, the uh, vertices at the top indexing rows and the vertices at rank J indexing columns, this incidence matrix, uh, W, has this nice property that its column space contains the jth eigenspace and is orthogonal to all the eigenspaces after j in that spe specified ordering. And so this is really the essence of these polynomials that we're getting at. I want to think of uh, the elements in v1 as linear functions, the elements in v2 as quadratic functions, and this is difficult to make precise. And so this ideal is, is trying to help me understand this relationship between these things. If I find such a poset, set, then it turns out that the things at rank one, just as it did in the, the cube in the very first slide, they give me quadratic polynomials that generate the ideal. So whenever I have this, um, this poset, set, then if I take X to be the set of columns, of E1, and I'm going to just work inside the vector space uh, V1, not the entire space, uh, then I get uh, gamma 1 of x, and gamma 2 of x are both equal to 2. So the ideal is generated by quadratic polynomials. Those posets um, 
are attached to some very beautiful association schemes. So for example, these classical families of association schemes, Hamming schemes, Johnson schemes, Grossman schemes, bilinear form schemes, um, all of these things uh, have these, these Q posets, these regular semi-lattices. And so therefore all of their ideals are, are generated for the E1. I'm looking at the ideals. Um, the, my spherical code is a set of columns of E1 and a Q polynomial association scheme. All of those are generated by quadratic polynomials. Next case I wanted to consider is the Paley graphs. So let FQ be a finite field, make Q congruent to one mod four so that we get an undirected graph. And a graph has vertex set equal to the finite field. And we join to if the difference between the, the group, the field elements is a non-zero square. So we get a strongly regular Cayley graph. And here it is for the field of order five square, non-zero squares are one and four. So we join each element A to A minus one and A plus one. This is a nice, um, a, a nice association scheme. There's something in the chat here. Um, question. I don't know if I can get to the chat without killing my thing. I oh. just said that lambda should be q minus five over four. Oh, I made a mistake. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. I, I, um, I, I did a drag and drop. Yeah. Uh, how can I end the chat? I don't know how to close that now. Uh, just a second. Yeah. So uh, yeah, there's a typo there. Thanks. Um, now I, I don't know how to close the chat. Okay, um, let's see if I can do that. Okay, well, all right, well, let me um, just move on if I can do that there. Okay, so, um, so with a, a WPI undergraduate who's now in a bachelor's master's program, I think he's working on sick POVMs right now uh, with a physicist. We looked at E1 for Paley graphs. And uh, the column space of E1 uh, is spanned by the set of characters corresponding to the quadratic residues, the perfect squares. And so instead of looking at the columns of E1, we're going to, um, uh, instead of looking at the columns of E1, uh, we're going to look at this matrix uh, whose rows are indexed by the elements of the field and the columns are indexed by the quadratic, the non-zero quadratic residues. And so each vector is going to be mapped to an element. Let me just use Q equal 13 for simplicity. An element in, in C6, where the entries uh, for vertex A are the values of the characters corresponding to quadratic residues evaluated at A. And we wanted to find the generating set for that ideal. And so it turned out that the generating set is this very nice uh, nice interpretation. So we can find a generating set of quadratic polynomials. And whenever we find two elements of uh, two, two pairs of quadratic residues, A, B, and C, and D, and we have to also allow ourselves to have zero here, where we just set Z0 equal one for convenience. Um, whenever that equation is true, we throw in the quadratic polynomial uh, ZA, ZB minus ZZ, ZC, ZD, understanding that sometimes Z0 is in there. It might not be quadratic. So that ideal is generated by, um, by these quadratic polynomials. And now there's going to be some recursion here. So this follows from uh, our, our proof that any function that uh, satisfies uh, these two equations, these conditions, uh, one and two, so a function on the finite, uh, on, on, the, on the elements uh, that maps zero to one and satisfies these equations for quadratic residues must be the restriction of some character of the, of the, uh, of the finite field. And in order to get that, we had to uh, check that any three elements of the Paley graph have a common neighbor. And, um, and, and I got stuck on that. And so I asked Andres Brower, uh, we had to prove that they have a common neighbor. The small cases, small q, we have, we have to worry about separately. I uh, asked Andres Brower for help, and it turned out that uh, that we just use the Hasse bound for elliptic curve over a finite field. So we take the elliptic curve x minus a times x minus b times x minus c equals y squared, and this elliptic curve, the Hasse bound says the number of points differs from uh, from 
q plus one by roughly um, roughly root q at most. And so once you have that Hasse bound for the number of points on an elliptic curve, then you get that the number of common neighbors, these are called triple intersection numbers, the number of common neighbors of a, b, and c is very, very close to q minus nine over eight. And that guarantees as long as q is big enough that, uh, that a, b, and c have a common neighbor. So once we have that, now we can prove that any uh, function that satisfies conditions one and two, that is, if the function is, has value one on the field element zero and satisfies um, psi of A times psi of B equals psi of C times psi of D whenever A plus B is equal to C plus D, that must be the, the um, restriction of some character of the finite field to the quadratic residues. And um, this uh, just requires us to locate this element that's adjacent. Uh, we needed to locate an element that's adjacent to both um, zero A and minus B. And then we, we get exactly what we need. Uh, for the small Paley graphs, uh, those numbers aren't exa exactly right. That was for Q bigger than 25. So for the small Paley graphs, Andres and I just put a table in our paper that showed what the what the various numbers are. They're not always constant. Um, okay, so that Paley graph is a special case of a strongly regular graph. And if I have a strongly regular graph, then any two vertices, it, sorry, the, the, um, there are only two possible distances between vertices. So it's an association scheme with two classes. And so any vertex gives us a zonal polynomial based at that vertex, that's the normal vector, um, with three inner products when I scale this to a, unit, uh, to a spherical code of unit vectors. So this zonal, zonal ideal turns out to be the entire ideal for these strongly regular graphs. Uh, it doesn't happen um, for these uh, non-maximal sets of mutually unbiased species, but, um, uh, and I think actually it also fails for complete multipartite graphs. I made a mistake there, but, um, but for primitive strongly regular graphs, you have this. And, uh, and so that the gamma one is at least two already and gamma two is at most three. And so now we have to figure out for which strongly regular graphs, that's a, a open question I have, for which strongly regular graphs do we get three and for which one do we get two? Now, some strongly regular graphs give us spherical four designs. And so we know that we have to have uh, gamma one equal to three for the spherical four designs. Um, with Doug Stinson, I decided to just look at um, block schemes of T designs. So suppose we have a TVK lambda designs. We have V points, we have blocks of size K, and uh, any T set is contained in exactly lambda blocks. In the nicest cases, these things induce Q polynomial subschemes of a Johnson scheme. And the Q polynomial ordering that you get from that proof uh, has basically the incidence matrix points versus blocks is basically the, the matrix of the, e, the spherical code, the E1 and the Q polynomial ordering that we're looking for. There's a translation and we have zero one vectors. There's, there's, there's some, um, some change of variables here. But uh, Doug and I looked at this and we found that uh, for T designs. Now the combinatorial T design is not always a spherical T design. And so this condition that gamma one is bigger than T over two uh, is, is uh, identical to, whoops, um, this, is a, this is the same idea as, but it's a separate result from the one um, about spherical designs. And gamma two is at most the block size. Now, if V choose S is bigger than the number of vertices, bigger than the number of blocks, then there's enough degrees of freedom to find some polynomial of degree S that vanishes on those points. And for Steiner systems, you can prove that uh, you can generate the ideal by polynomials of degree at most T. It's for symmetric designs, the lines, the lines, there's a, another typo there, a PGDQ, you get quadratic elements, but uh, you can find lots of triple systems where gamma two is equal to three. And there's a missing sentence that's probably not important. Let me um, now go to uh, duality. So 
p-polynomial association scheme. It's one where we can order the relations so that pijk is zero if k is too big, if k is bigger than i plus j. And pijk is strictly non-zero if k is exactly i plus j. And these are exactly distance regular graphs. Well, you have to choose an ordering. There might be multiple p-polynomial orderings, but once you choose a p-polynomial association scheme and a p-polynomial ordering on its relations, you get a distance regular graph from relation one. Conversely, if you have a distance regular graph, then the distance relations for that graph give you a p-polynomial association scheme. The odd graphs and Johnson graphs are examples where you might have two p-polynomial orderings, and the polygons are a headache for everything. Polygons, you can have hundreds of p-polynomial orderings for an appropriately chosen polygon. Now, Delsart decided, well, since these are important, why not consider the same idea for the crime parameters? So the scheme is co-metric, a q-polynomial. If you can order the idempotents, order the eigenspaces, so that when k is too big, qijk is zero. And when k is just right, when k is equal to i plus j, then the prime parameter qijk is positive. And these things have been very interesting to me. I don't understand them, but I still want to study them. Questions at this point? I haven't stopped for questions. Sebi's always a good person to ask questions. Are there any graphs where you have uh, uh, gamma one, two, and gamma two, three? I missed that. Strongly regular graphs. Um, yeah, I think I know some strongly regular graphs where that's true, but I don't have one off the top of my head. Good question. So, um, so the idea here is we take a Q-polynomial association scheme, we have a Q-polynomial ordering of the idempotents, E0, E1 up to ET, then the standard module breaks up into these eigenspaces, and it's closed under entrywise multiplication. But the entrywise multiplication behaves in a very polynomial-like way for Q-polynomial schemes. If I have a vector U that's in the ith eigenspace, I want to think of that as a polynomial of degree I, and V is in the jth eigenspace, I'd love to think of that as a polynomial of degree J, and the crime parameter QIJH is zero, then U entrywise product V is orthogonal to the H eigenspace. That's an, a famous paper of Cameron Huttels and Seidel has this as a little result that I, I just uh, love this result and I use it all the time. So the entrywise product of all the vectors, so I take the, the the manifold by taking this eigenspace and I take the entrywise product of that with every single vector in this eigenspace, that sort of variety is contained in this sum of eigenspaces up to degree at most i plus j. And so the elements in vj behave somehow like polynomials degree j in, in, in v1, but this is not precisely speaking. And, and sort of the goal of everything I've done right now up to here is to try to make that more precise. So we're always trying to infer local global information from local information. Wouldn't we love if distance regular graphs could have sort of a Lie algebra attached to a vertex so that we can figure out the entire Lie group just by looking locally in detail at what goes on at a single vertex? We'd love to infer um, everything about a distance regular graph just by knowing the first few neighborhoods. Polygons are an exception. We can't do this for polygons, but we'd like to be able to do this for anything but a polygon. Likewise, the dual concept for me is that for Q polynomial or co-metric association scheme, I want to infer the entire association scheme from the first few eigenspaces. Now that's sort of a vacuous statement because the first eigenspace, if I know the vectors in the first eigenspace, if I know the, the columns of E1, I can reconstruct the entire association scheme. But I just want to know what dependencies, when, these, when, when I multiply these things entry-wise, what collisions occur? When does U entry-wise V when can I find, let's say, four vectors, u, v, u prime, and v prime, all in the first eigenspace, so that u entrywise v is equal to u prime entrywise v prime? This kind of collapsing, this kind of collapsing, I think of as dual to cycles in, in graphs. So take the sixth cycle, for example. Almost out of time, so I'm going to go. Um, I think I'll, I'll skip this example. So the sixth cycle. 
Um, what I want to do is I want to map the six vertices to the columns of E1. So now my variables Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, Z5, Z6 map to these six vectors in, inside this two-dimensional eigenspace. And now um, I have the algebra of polynomials, addition, scalar multiplication, polynomial multiplication, and I have this standard module, addition, um, scalar multiplication, and entrywise product. We have a ring homomorphism from the one to the other. This actually shows up, I think, probably first in a paper by uh, Marston Condor and Chris Godsell on the symmetric group. This ring homomorphism is very interesting. It takes uh, polynomials, and by sending each variable to the corresponding column of E1, now remember for the, for the six cycle, I really am in R2, right? So there's a bunch of linear relations here. Um, but, uh, but I'm going to take these six variables and map them into, in, into this eigenspace and then extend by multiplication and addition and scalar multiplication. And the, this evaluation map, epsilon, this is just an evaluation map, there's nothing deep going on here, map Z1, Z1 to Z plus Z2 to the sum of those two columns, but Z1 times Z2 is mapped to the entryized product of these two columns, 2, 1, minus 1, 2, 2, minus 1, if I did it right, 2, 2, minus 1, 2, 2, minus 1, uh, all divided by 36. Um, columns 1, 3, and 5 sum to 0, so that polynomial maps to 0. But columns 1 times column 2, you'll get the same exact thing if you mul multiply columns 4 and 5. So this polynomial maps to 0. So this ring homomorphism, you have a co-metric association scheme on V vertices, first idempotent in the two polynomial order in E1. We take this evaluation map that maps, there's a variable for each vertex, and we map Z sub A to the A column of E1 and extend linearly and the sure product for polynomial multiplication. And now the ideal we've been looking at is essentially up to a couple of linear change of variables and, and, and linear relations that I'm not interested in. It's essentially the kernel of this map. So the ideal that we've been looking at is the kernel of this map. So <clears throat> we'll call linear polynomials trivial. And so this is essentially the same ideal as, as the one before. The gamma one and gamma two, as long as I call the linear polynomials orthogonal to the eigenspace um, trivial, then uh, this is uh, going, going to have the same parameters, gamma one and gamma two. So the coordinate ring of the variety, so you have a finite variety and the coordinate ring is just a set of all functions on those vertices. So that's exactly the standard module. But the nice thing is that in that coordinate ring, right, the set of functions on the vertices of the spherical code, those functions, that's all functions on vertices, but the polynomial functions of degree J are exactly the things in the eigenspaces zero up to J. And so there's this, some, there's this mapping preserves degree in that sense. There's some collapsing going on. Now, just let me finish with this surprising connection to homotopy. So take a distance regular graph. And, um, and we start at a base point and we look at the fundamental group. We look at the, the, all, of the, um, uh, all of the closed walks that start and end at uh, this base point. And then we um, multiply these by concatenation. Now there's a little adjustment that Terwilliger and, and Heather Lewis make. Um, if you have a closed walk that looks like a lollipop, it goes out from X and it goes wandering out into the woods, then it does something interesting and then comes back to X. The length of that walk, the essential length of that walk is only the interesting part. We subtract um, off the, the stuff in the middle. So that way we can take closed walks that start and end at different points in the graph and concatenate those and not think of them as, as a very long if, if, the, uh, if the tails that go back to the base point are long. So, so Heather Lewis in her thesis at Wisconsin looked at the, um, the subgroups generated by closed walks of essential length at most k. And she proved that the first couple are trivial. And then finally, when you get to the triangles, if you have triangles in your graph, then you get a non-trivial subgroup, generate, uh, g sub 3. And if the girth is bigger than 3, then that's still the trivial subgroup. So, the, so it's only when you get up to the girth that you start to get a non-trivial subgroup. And she proved that at twice 
the diameter plus one, uh, you get the full fundamental group of the graph. And so if you look at a translation association scheme, so now assume that you have a Cayley graph like we did for the Cayley graphs, Cayley graph on an abelian group, then you have a dual association scheme on the characters. These come in dual pairs. And I think that it, since I'm running out of time, I'm just going to um, say that once I have a cometric association scheme, which has this translation property, it's a Cayley graph for an abelian group, then I can define a gr graph on the characters where I join, um, I, I, I join character psi to psi entrywise chi, uh, if chi is in the first, um, in, in, in the first uh, relation here, the, the set of characters, then, uh, then we get a graph and that graph is, is distance regular if we started with a Q polynomial association scheme. So closed walks turn into polynomials in the ideal. And in fact, if you have a closed walk of length 11, uh, then you have this closed walk is equal to one, that minus one is zero, and then you can multiply through by the inverses of the characters and you can get the degree 11 down to degree six. So everything going from the closed walks and the homotopy over to the ideals, you divide by two. And um, let me just um, go to, um, so the cycles are special. Cycles, you, you, um, you get, get closed walks, of the smallest closed walk, uh, that's non-trivial can have very high length and the smallest polynomial in the ideal can have very high degree. So we have to throw away the cycles. And I conjectured, before we wrote the Leach lattice paper, I conjectured that there's some constant K such that any Q polynomial association scheme where we're in dimension bigger than two, the ideal is generated by polynomials of total degree at most K. I wasn't sure if I wanted to choose k equals six. So I said, perhaps k equals six. Now, what Jason Williford and I could prove is that for each m, there is a k so that the ideal is generated by polynomials of degree at most k of m, that particular k, but the k might grow with m. Okay, so we proved this is essentially the same thing as proving that there are only finitely many cometric association schemes uh, with E1 having rank fixed M greater than two. So we know that the ideal is generated by at degree at most K polynomials for some K depending on M, but we don't know if that's constant. Um, if you can prove that K is six, then you find that the no Q polynomial association schemes could give you spherical T designs for T bigger than 11. So if you can prove that at most six is, is, is correct, then there are some consequences about spherical T designs. Um, in fact, the non-existence of, of uh, association schemes giving spherical T designs um, would result just from showing that gamma one, that gamma one is at least uh, as at most six, right? As soon as you know that gamma one is at most K, then you know that you can't have spherical T designs giving you Q polynomial schemes. Um, let me just uh, skip over that. So this is um, th this is uh, my little picture of duality. Let me finish with this picture. Okay, so I said that we proved that for any fixed m greater than two, gamma two is bounded above by a function of m. The dual of that is this famous theorem of Bang, Colon, Moulton, and, and Dubicus. I put them in non-alphabetical order at random. Uh, for any fixed valency bigger than two, the number of distance regular graphs is, is um, sorry, I can't see my own slide. Um, sorry, yeah, uh, oh, oh, the girth. Right? So the, the, the G2 is the smallest G such that you can get the, 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 um, the fundamental group from the um, paths of essential length G2. I think Suzuki conjectured, although other people have talked about this conjecture too, for any distance regular graph of valency bigger than two, the girth should be at most 12. And, uh, and I'm gonna conjecture that gamma one is at most six. I don't know if anyone has conjectured this. Maybe you can tell me. For any distance regular graph of valency bigger than two, the fundamental group is generated by closed walks of essential length at most 12. The dual of that is saying that the ideal is generated by polynomials of degree at most six. And if it's also P polynomial, I think that, that the ideal is gonna be generated by polynomials of degree at most three. 
And Lewis proved that if you have a Q polynomial distance regular graph, then the girth is, is at most six. And, uh, and, and then finally, if you have the P, P and Q polynomial association scheme, gamma two, sorry, gamma two is at most three, maybe with some known exceptions. So, uh, so this, is, uh, this is the thing I wanna finish with is that picture. And I thank you very much for your time. Let me see if I can get to the next slide though. There we go, thanks for your time. Thank you, Martin. Interesting talk. Uh, is there any questions for Bill? I have a quick question. So uh, are there any strongly regular graphs still coming back to gamma one and gamma two for which you don't know gamma one and gamma two? Sure, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know all strongly regular graphs. So, so if I don't know the strongly regular graphs. No, no, but like if somebody like, would give you yeah. one, like how would you, how do you determine these numbers? Hmm. Well, I think, um, so, so the, the the conference graphs are, are, are a worry for me because um, so so the quadratic polynomials tend to come from completely regular codes, right? So the quadratic polynomials, all you need is an equitable partition with two parts, and then you get a quadratic polynomial. And as soon as you have enough of those, you can, uh, well, you certainly have gamma one equal to two, but you can often get gamma two equal to two. Um, but that's why we've looked at the Paley graphs, and, and I didn't have time to mention this, but we were really looking at the Paley ETFs. Once you have the once you have the ideal for the Paley graph, then you can move to the equiangular lines and you can get the homogeneous ideal uh, by just a simple adjustment. And so you can get a generating set for the homogeneous ideal of the equiangular lines. So that was one reason we were looking at the conference graphs, but also, also because um, those are irrational. And so we're not going to get um, quadratic polynomials that factor in, in, into uh, you know, these parallel hyperplanes. Um, but, yeah, I imagine I, I probably wouldn't know for conference graphs other than Paley graphs. I probably won't, don't know what the answer is. And this theorem that you have uh, with uh, Brouwer, so it says that for um, any three vertices uh, in Q bigger than 25, they have a common neighbor? Is that yeah, and, and, and they have a common number of vertices. You, mention, you name any three numbers, H, I, J, equal to one, two, and two, or two, two, one, two, or two, one, one, or whatever you want, um, then there's a non-zero, th then there's always a vertex at distance H from the first, I from the second, J from the Okay, first. so yeah, so you have more general results, not just for uh, adjacency. One, one, one. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a two-page paper that ended up four pages in the journal, but... Um, okay. uh, but do you expect that this would go on? I mean, I, this is maybe a silly question, but like, any four vertices if Q is large enough, something happens or? Um, I think we did mention quadruple intersection numbers in that paper. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I mean, the, 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 right, the Paley graphs are kind of pseudo random, right? So you should have this sort of uh, existential thing, right? That, that there should exist, um, Q is large enough, there should exist a vertex that satisfies whatever contortions you, you want to go through. I don't know though. Okay, thank you.